Um, anyway, welcome. Uh, it's been a long time since we were together, and it's a kind of like bookend. So Peter Sussman's previous program, July 20th, uh, 2020, uh, on the third wave of Linden Hills development, that was when we began offering our Zoom programs. So uh, these are our bookends, the start and the end. Um, now, uh, it's, we will turn to Peter. I'm very delighted to introduce Peter Sussman, local historian, architect, and active member of Preserve Minneapolis. He has had a significant role in the preservation and interpretation of Minneapolis history, and specifically southwest and the north side of Minneapolis. Some notable projects that he's worked on was the Lake Harry Bandshell, the Memorial of the Bede Makaska. He has presented many, many programs over the years on local women leaders, organizations, history of neighborhood houses, buildings, their occupants, and businesses. The history of the Lake Harriet Banshell is an area of specific interest to Peter, as was demonstrated in the Star Tribune article. He is known for thorough research, careful deliberation and interpretation, openness to listen and share with others, and an impressive recall of facts and dates. The fun postcards that many of us have been familiar with, um, we're going to get to learn more about, remember all the ones with the the pony carts and the ostriches. I think we'll finally get some more in-depth information. Anyway, let's welcome Peter. Thank you. Well, thank you, Joellen, and welcome back, everybody. I, I know that our audience goes beyond those of you here tonight because August is videotaping this and. Thanks again for doing that over the last year. Uh, and so we have a much wider audience than uh, those here tonight, although it's, it's great to see you. <clears throat> so I was thinking about how I had been uh, planning this for some time, because I've been researching some of these individuals for many years. And I was thinking today about the irony of having a program on concessionaires or a program finally in person when we don't have any refreshments. <laughs> so I apologize for that, but you can go online. I don't know, I don't know how long it's going to be, but in the near future, you'll find it online. You can watch it at home and have some snacks. Uh, Joella mentioned that I have these interests, and part of the interest I have in local history is um, being familiar with individuals, a lot of whom aren't well known. They aren't the ones who get mentioned in the prominent at Waters history. I would almost have gotten through the whole evening without mentioning probably the most significant person uh, who is well known, and that's Thomas Lowry, who uh, owned the streetcar company, owned at least one of these pavilions, and uh, owned a lot of Linden Hills and named the neighborhood. But this isn't about Thomas Lowry. It's the people who worked for him, and uh, those who went before and came after, uh, and carries at, at the end to the modern day. So. so we recognize uh, the Dakota people uh, which is appropriate in our area because we're so familiar with the history of uh, their presence here. And with the founding of uh, Fort Snelling, there was an Indian agent, Lawrence Tolliver, who drew this map and has lots of interesting notes there about uh, distance to this, distance to that. But he was very instrumental in uh, helping to set up what he referred to as Eatonville, what we know as Claudman's Village. Uh, and that's a painting in the lower right corner at the Dame Costco. Uh, but I've blown out a little detail of the map because long before there were pavilions and uh, large groups coming to Lake Harry with visitors, uh, there was a, a mission school uh, that was founded by uh, missionaries, including Stevens and Riggs, was there for a while. 
Han brothers came over after a while also, for about five years. And uh, it was there from about uh, 1835 to 1840. So it wasn't as big as it looks on this map. It wasn't the entire west shore of the lake, but I sort of like diagrammatically how it's set up and it suggests what may have been there, including the mission school itself. I'm going to get back to where it probably was. You may have seen the marker down at the foot of the depot, down at uh, the Banshell area. That's probably not where it was. This map is probably closer. Um, piece written in 1869 from the perspective of the uh, many politics of the day, uh, celebrating the progress from the, the indigenous people to the, the modern civilization. So the point I wanted to make was that uh, the land transitions from being the Dakota homeland to something that is sold, you can buy it through the government program, up to 160 acres, a dollar and a quarter or so an acre, and the key thing is it becomes a commodity. And the whole meaning of that land and the ownership changes with the settlement and the community that's built up. We have uh, the, the great good fortune, I recognize several of you who probably along with myself, when you wanted to do some research, you'd go to the library and you'd get these cumbersome microfilms and hope that the reader was actually working and that you would lose your eyesight. And then it's Joelle's fault, I blame her, but I think in 2009 she gave me a link to what the library was then offering through ProQuest, where you could do a word search for a, a name or something significant, and all of a sudden the world opens up. So we have much more access to what has been digitized uh, and is searchable online, uh, and yet not everything, not all sources have been, and sometimes things are a little bit obscure to find. And significantly, for the purposes of this talk in particular, uh, what did it take for something to be recorded in a newspaper? Sometimes it was a disaster or something. You know, it was just odd things where maybe the first of the main concessionaires I'm going to mention, we find out about his big lake area probably two years after he arrived because the depot burned down and he lost his stock. Well, we know he was there before that, but the Minneapolis Tribune and the other newspapers are not coming along and recording the day-to-day -day activities for the most part. So before we get, this is sort of the prehistory in terms of concessionaires, but I ran across an article I had bookmarked long ago. Um, and this is a group in 1863 coming down to the lake. And the reason that this caught my attention is uh, they're, they're praising the, uh, the gentleman who keeps the place. All the plans, all the provisions were excellent. Um, the gentleman who keeps the place knows how to please the public, and they go on to say how reasonable this was uh, compared to other resorts. Well, it was really pretty much at the outskirts of uh, where people might be traveling at that time. This is 1863, and at both Lake Helpman and Lake Harriet, there had been people leasing boats, um, sailboats, uh, for years before that, because you've got visitors coming definitely by the early 1850s that are visiting the lakes. Okay. So I mentioned uh, property ownership and what was happening uh, because there were individuals who recognized the potential of this area by the lakes, even though we're as much as five miles from St. Anthony Falls. And one of those was Colonel William S. King. You probably uh, know of the Park over where the Rose Garden is, the Lindell Park, Lindell Farmstead, where the park board has their operations headquarters. Uh, Lindell Farm was more than 1,400 acres, which is quite a quite a large amount of property, but also it encompassed the entire east side of Lake Calhoun and the east side of Lake Harriet and the north side and much of the west side where this neighborhood is today. And these were some of the farm buildings of uh, the Lindell Farm. On the left, uh, it doesn't enter into this evening's talk so much, but that was Jonathan Grimes' home. That was his new home, which was built in the 
1867. It's on the National Register of Historic Places, and it's on West 44th Street, just a few blocks west of France Avenue in what is now Edina, but this was all Richville Township at the time. And he had the Calvin Nursery. And the lower left-hand corner, that's the second owner of that house, Colonel Charles Reeve. And the original owner was Widow Thornton, who built the house, the beautiful brick house up at the southwest uh, Lake Harriet in the 1850s. So there were a few families out here. Uh, they were either farmers or smaller landholders uh, as things were subdivided. OK, so our next uh, group of uh, picnickers is coming out here on the Second Congregationalist in 1877. And this is uh, where we start to get a name associated with somebody who's actually pr providing for these uh, visitors. And his name is James Beatty, and his wife, who doesn't get named. Uh, but they're both in their 80s. Uh, he had been a well digger. He had been born, I think, in Scotland in the late 1700s. And this was sort of his retirement uh, employment was uh, he was under contract with Will Colonel King, who owned Area around the area, and so he is uh, out there uh, taking care of this group and renting them boats. Uh, we know that uh, he remains at the area through 1879, which is a pivotal point because everything changes in 1880. Uh, so even though we're not considering him one of the concessionaires, it's at least the, it's at least the first person who is out there on purpose uh, renting in this case, boats and providing for visitors. Uh, I had found fragmentary references to uh, somebody's like the old man's house, but never mentioning who the man is, so I'm pretty convinced it's James Beatty. There's also uh, this strange phenomena that I've probably mentioned before, where even though the lifespan typically wasn't that long back in the 1800s, there are at least a half dozen individuals that I know that were closely connected to the lake that lived to be almost 100 years old. And James Beattie died when he was 97. Eli, Pet Eli Pettyjohn, who owned the area that we're talking about, this neighborhood, um, was the last surviving member of the Hennepin County Pioneer, Pioneer Group. And he was close to 100 also when he passed away. Yeah. You know, what do you think the, the phrase, the rightful monopoly through Colonel King's wife, kindly interest? OK, well, Tom's going to be picky here. OK, so <laughs> let me just clarify that a lot of this is accumulated from fragmentary information. We don't have the contract. No. Um, and I think that's the case with all of these concessionaires. We can sort of infer what the scope of their, um, their rights were. Uh, but I would say that because King owned the lake front, that this was an exclusive right, whether he was providing food and how formal the contract was and what the terms were, we don't know. Uh, but it appears that it was more than just, oh, I'm moving into a house down there and he's letting me do this. It's okay. Uh, but he had an agreement. Okay. So Colonel King, um, is uh, having some difficulty in a downturn in the economy in the 1870s. Uh, but he's still going strong, and he uh, is trying to, what they refer to as booming this district, promoting it. Uh, because he realizes there's this potential for growth in the area. He's not just buying it to raise livestock. He's buying it because he has a great future in terms of uh, residential development in particular. But initially, it's going to be a recreational resort area. So the, these photographs are what was then, and for 200 years almost, referred to as Lake Calhoun. And that's the pavilion, the initial version of the pavilion. It's on the site of what's now Lake uh, St. Mary's Greek Orthodox Church. Uh, beautiful promontory view up there. And 1877 is when that's built. But then uh, what, what happens that's of interest to me and to the story is that the Lindale Railroad, or what it's referred to as the motor line, is running from Bridge Square, downtown Minneapolis, out to Lake Calhoun, reaches it in 1879. 
And those are the cars in the upper right hand corner with the pavilion in the background. And then uh, they have a boat on Lake Calhoun, the Hattie steamboat uh, for excursionists. Uh, so Lake Calhoun is that much closer to town, uh, but certainly people who are coming out here are going to be interested in visiting Lake Harriet. And indeed, the line is extended and opens on July 4th of 1880 and brings big crowds to Lake Harriet. <clears throat> so there's, I, I, I know some of you do look at old newspapers and it's like a, almost a different world in some ways. And they've got these terms in the name of the column. It's like gossip around town. And there are just you know one, two, three lines of about dozens of, of things here. Uh, but these are immediately after that July 4th opening of the motor line to Lake Harriet. There hadn't been any pavilion or band shell or anything that was pre-existing as a structure. Uh, but this is the first reference we see here to this uh, dancing platform. 30 by 50 feet, that's pretty big. I mean, it's probably bigger than this room, okay? So that you have a pretty good dance, size dance there in that platform. Um, but also from the beginning, the owners of the motor line uh, are convinced that as opposed to other resorts, uh, this is going to be, they don't use the term temperance, but you know it's non-alcoholic as far as uh, the type of crowd that they want down here. Uh, I had mentioned in the description for the program this bear that's down in Lake Area that's kept by uh, Colonel, Colonel McCrory, whose uh, railroad this is, and he's got a zoological garden, uh, and the bear reaches through and grabs somebody's picnic basket. Uh, but a few months later, I don't know if it's because of this behavior, but uh, the bear is transferred to Lake Calhoun, where maybe it's got more secure uh, enclosures. <laughs> I don't know. See, it's um, Aaron Isaacs isn't here this evening, but you know we're both fascinated by old photographs, and you'll see a hundred photographs from a certain vantage point looking in a certain direction. I want the photograph of the building behind the photographer, and it doesn't exist, so I don't know the bear's name. So, but if you ever find out, let me know. <clears throat> so Jonathan Palmer is the first of four major concessionaires I want to talk about tonight. And um, we do know quite a bit about him and his businesses, where he lived, where he came from, um, where he was before and after he had ran this uh, business at Lake Harriet. But we don't actually know when he arrived and started this business. I certainly don't have any indication of the contract terms that he had with the motor line. <clears throat> but he did have what you would then have these, these business cards that he had printed up uh, colorful. I've got uh, five all together, but these are the two that use the boat themes. And he was, uh, you can, I don't know if you're at the distance where you can read this clearly, but in one case, um, he's talking about lunch, candy, ice cream, uh, ice cream, lemonade, birch beer, Pop, but oh, they called it pop even then. Uh, lunch goods of all kinds, cigars and tobacco, very important. Uh, so there were boats down at uh, Lake Harriet, including sailboats, and there had been for some years, but then uh, John Palmer, part of what his business was, besides having the provisions in the depot, the small depot built next to the motor line tracks up the hill a little bit, close to where it, uh, it is now, but, people that the streetcar museum uses. Um, and as I mentioned, we, we hear about his being down there in June of 1882 because on June 5th, we see in the newspaper that the depot was burned down. And we know how much he lost in stock that was in the depot, but we hadn't heard his name anywhere that I can find attached to being down there in the period. I'm presuming that he pretty much started that business in relationship with the motor line when the motor line uh, extended to Lake Harriet in July of 1880, and they had their large crowds, they had to have some provisions for the crowds. Uh, but Palmer remained at the lake until uh, at least 1884, and a lot of things got complicated at this point, which I'll talk about. 
But um, some of you may know, or may have even had a neighbor who uh, wrote a book about uh, the community and the community's history. Her name was Beatrice Morosco. And she came across her family's, uh, her grandfather's diaries. And there's one mention uh, in the diary of her mother Julia going down to Lake Harriet. I don't know the specific date, but sometime in the early 1880s, and uh, going for a ride on her grandfather Ebenezer's sailboat. Uh, and she had a meal at Palmer's, which she described in fantastical terms, uh, but it may have been more like a really good sandwich. We just don't know. That <laughs> And I was intrigued, and this was back around 1983, 84 or so, uh, and I called her up. I said, what else can you tell me from the diaries? I'd love to see that. And she basically said that was the only thing, the only mention of uh, Ebenezer down to Lake Harriet was that one visit that uh, the daughter paid and went sailing and had a meal. So uh, we don't have any other reports of uh, what was served by others. Uh, but we do know about Palmer. Let's see. So this is, uh, if, if you're familiar with the format of photographs, there were stereo views where you'd have the viewer, like the early 3D technology, and uh, cabinet cars. But this is a blow up of the detail there. Uh, and I don't know if there are any English teachers. I know there's some librarians here. Uh, but I think the, the price that's written on the tent there on the dock for your sailboat ride is it's one dollars, plural, one dollars for uh, for an hour. Uh, no, it's, it's it's much less than a dollar. I think it's like ten cents uh, for an hour. But uh, good good crowd there, a lot of rowboats, a few sailboats, and based on the address that. This photographer Noah was at, at the time, this is probably about 1884. That's probably Jonathan Palmer's talk. <clears throat> so we're, we're covering now the part before the park board comes in and takes control of Lake Harriet, which happens in 1885. So the lower left-hand corner, that's a small hotel that was built on what's now halfway down the Linden Hills Boulevard between 40th and 42nd, not too far from here, is the Bellevue House. Uh, upper left-hand corner is an experimental type of engine that was going to replace the steam engine. This was an early type of electric motor, and uh, they're pulling around here is an excursion party and a big banner saying, uh, grand open air concerts at Lake Calhoun and Lake Harriet. So there were ongoing concerts uh, from the early 1880s on these dance platforms, uh, private parties for the most part. And even though it says concerts, I'm not sure where the concerts were held. But this was the time at which Jonathan Palmer was down there uh, being the official concessionaire of the motor line. Uh, beautiful little uh, party out here along the shore about the same time, about 1884-85. Uh, this is a different photographer, Zin, Z-I-N-N. Um, but you see that there's no, in this case, at least this part of the lake, there's no uh, boulevard or you know, drive around the entire lake. Uh, they're, they're right down to the shore. They have a few little tents along there. And tenting was really big at Lake Harriet for many years. Yeah. Um, the picture of the Bellevue House, would that be the lakeside or the Linden Hills? That's, that's the lakeside, and actually, uh, it's a later photograph because the group that's there is the Lurvine Club, which took over the Bellevue House in 1894, but the building is the 1884 when Louis Minaj built it. So I put it in with the earlier group according to its construction date. So, like, what do you think would have likely? The lot would have gone all the way down. Oh, yeah, it went to what's now Queen, yeah. uh, which that hadn't been planted yet, but it didn't go down to the lake shore, it went down roughly to the tracks from, and it, then it was Boulevard was actually a different road, slightly different 
a line you can see on the early atlases, but we know within 100 feet or so where, where this was. So I included this slide because Jonathan Palmer runs into some competition and some unfavorable business conditions. Uh, the motor line changes ownership and the park board acquires the lakeshore in 1885, largely through gifts, uh, including from Colonel William King. And uh, in the meantime, for all this time, Palmer has been running businesses in town, which are generally the type of bakery, for the most part, or lunch business. Uh, so this wasn't his year-round business at Lake Harriet or his major business. Um, but he'd been watching these trains go by. After 1880, the motor line extends out to uh, the south shore of Lake Minnetonka, and that becomes the main traffic, the main recreation destination for a lot of people. So he's been watching all these people run stay on the train and go right past his business and they carry it for years. And so he buys uh, a place on the newly platted Zumbra Heights. This is the upper lake, just north of Lake Zumbra. There's a railroad station nearby. And so uh, he's got the hilltop between Lake Zumbra and Lake Minnetonka and builds the Palmer House and operates a hotel there with his wife, Nellie. And so they're set, you know, 1887, 1888. It's a boom time for recreation um, out of Lake Minnetonka, and it becomes one of those prominent places that's mentioned weekly in the, uh, the tourist-related trade magazines and newspapers of the time. Years later, uh, that property is purchased in 1904 by Calvin Goodrich, Thomas Lowry's brother-in-law, uh, and has a beautiful home built there. I think Harry Well Jones is the architect and uh, it no longer exists, but now there's a very expensive subdivision called Palmer Point, named after Jonathan Palmer. And uh, so it's got that little connection back to uh, Palmer. Palmer was from Ohio. He had several brothers that served in the Union Army. They were in the occupying army down in Alabama in the Civil War. Um, and they liked it so much that a year or two after the war was over, the two of his brothers went down there and settled. So, uh, I tell visitors from around the country that if you don't have to live in Minnesota in the winter, if you had any opportunity, you had a place to go south for the winter. Palmer's place was he would run the hotel at Lake Minnetonka in the summer and go down, stay with his family in Alabama in the winter, and he was there in 1891 when he passed away. Uh, he did a project nearby, and I actually went to the family graveyard, but it's an unmarked grave. But it's sort of interesting end to uh, Jonathan Palmer. Nellie ran the hotel for several years before selling it to uh, Goodrich. Okay, so some of you uh, will recognize this gentleman, H.W.S. Cleveland. He's hired by the newly formed Board of Park Commissioners in 1883, and he comes up with this uh, concept for taking advantage of the main natural features of the area, whether they're the chain of lakes, including Lake Calhoun and Lake Harriet, or the, in particular, the River Gorge, which he was just enthralled with and absolutely knew that that River Gorge had to be preserved. So he has the idea of starting with what becomes the Grand Browns Boulevards connecting. Uh, the plans went way beyond this. He didn't even include the boulevard along Minnehaha Creek to Minnehaha Falls at this point, or nobody told him about what became Theodore Worth Park that beautiful area in there, they were all pointing him towards what they knew about the falls and the, the lakes and the river. So this is just the, the, um, the germ of an idea, but the boulevard is going to extend completely around Lake Erie, which it soon did in 1885. The photograph on the left uh, is that a high definition version of this photograph, but if you look towards the center, there's a little white spot there that's the top of a tent structure. And the park board has created this boulevard, boulevard around the lake. In this case, you'd be standing more or less where the current band shell is, looking out there. 
along the shoreline, which has been filled in over the years since this photograph was taken in 1887. Uh, and then on the right is a painting of the same scene looking from closer to this tented structure uh, and it's moonlit. So here's a little bit of a close up and then a detail as much as I could pull out of the, uh, with my editing skills. Uh, the, the atmosphere of being under this tented enclosure. And this is uh, Alexis Fournier, who became very well known, a young artist. Um, the review is from 1889, but the painting is earlier than that. We don't have a date on the painting. Uh, they're saying that you know, the scene will at once be recognized, a very charming contrast between the ruddy light through the canvas roof of the pavilion, so they're calling it the pavilion. Uh, on the right, and the cool moonlit sky in Lake Yan. This painting is owned by the Hennepin History Museum, and in the past it's also been displayed at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. I don't know if it's on display now, but it's absolutely beautiful. Um, so, I can't connect this painting and that photograph with who built the structure and the year it was built. There's clearly some food service going on here. Um, was Jonathan Palmer ever involved in this business? And if not, we don't know the name of the person who was. But the motor line um, was very interested in drawing customers down, riders down to the lake, and uh, giving them some opportunities, whether it was boats or, or provisions along the way. OK, first big pavilion. This is uh, an important turning point because in 1888, uh, we have a new owner of the motor line. His name is Thomas Lowry. He has acquired this indebted company, and uh, he decides they're going to build a pavilion to attract people out there. And of course, you need a manager for this huge pavilion. I think it's a 500-seat restaurant and a large auditorium for concerts. Uh, there's along the lake facing side of the pavilion were these uh, like bar stools. You could sit along the counter and watch the, the crowd go by along the lake. <clears throat> so A.O. Hoyt becomes the manager, so I'm calling him uh, the concessionaire. He was very much involved in the community for a long time, but he was really only the manager of this pavilion for one year. He first came to Lake Harriet in 1881, soon after the motor line opened up. He was the conductor and operator of the uh, steam engine of the motor line. And he actually was one of the first uh, who went out then to Lake Minnetonka as the line was extended. So there's recollections uh, of his time early on. But then he went to work for this uh, minister who had gone into real estate. His name was Henry Beard. And if you know the Beard's Plaisance, it's uh, that land was donated by Beard uh, at the same time that the lake shore was donated. So that, uh, that special part. So uh, White was very active in Beard's office, and as part of his compensation, Beard gave him a share of the land out here. So uh, part of the land that White owned was this land that the pavilion was built on. And so I think that uh, as he was leaving Beard's office, this was an opportunity for him to uh, get connected with Lowry and get connected with the pavilion. So at least for that first year, White was the manager. Uh, by the next year, he's uh, built himself a little fruit stand or a little small business on what's now Queen Avenue, just south of uh, 42nd Street. So he's no longer connected with the uh, pavilion. So sometime between the beginning of the season of 1889 and when the pavilion burns down at the beginning of the season of 1891, two years later, somebody is managing this pavilion. I think I know who it was. Uh, there aren't really any good photographs of the pavilion. This is one. It's a cabinet card looking from where Linders would be, or the Rose Garden, basically. Um, and that lighter shape on the horizon there on the shore, that's the pavilion, the 1888 pavilion across the lake. Peter, can I yeah. ask you a question about the pavilion? Um, is it, I, I think I was reading something recently, is it open on the left two thirds of it? Yeah, pretty much. The, the concert hall is to, on the right. That's 
So it was, it was an oddly shaped building because it was following the curve of the lake shore. So it was very long. Um, but at one end, there was an enclosed concert space, and the rest of it was the restaurant. And it, and it was relatively open at the restaurant end of things. And this is the only photograph that I have. And the, the other uh, image is even less descriptive, which is on the left. Uh, so the Twin Cities were you know, part of the rapidly growing West, and the Harper's Weekly National Magazine sent out uh, W. Rogers, one of their artists, and he captured two scenes uh, for their covers. I think it was July and August of uh, 1890. Um, one being the, the uh, finely dressed, this looks like some royal procession in London. I'm not sure how realistic this was. Yeah. Oh yeah, and then the rooftop uh, restaurant of the Metropolitan Building. So they carry it's right up there with uh, you know the finest place that people would well dressed people would come up to visit and describe this to a national audience. So I want to mention that I, I mentioned that White was connected beyond this one year and even beyond uh, his work with Beard. Uh, part of the land that he owned, well, first of all, his second house survives. It's at 4290 Queen Avenue, which is where uh, the Hills Boulevard comes in at the top, or by the streetcar bridge. Uh, and it's a bungalow built in 1910. He had an original house that was built in the 1880s, soon after he moved into the area. But he maintained ownership of the block just south of the tracks. And uh, it was planted in his place, Crestmont. What he was using it for was he was the last person who was uh, renting to summer campers uh, at the lake into the early 1900s. Uh, before he planted it and sold off the lots. So he, uh, I get to the end of his story, but he, despite living in the area for decades, he eventually moved up to Los Angeles and lived until 1940. So there's another image of that 1880 pavilion. And uh, they had, somebody had done this wood block or whatever etching process they had. So this was an advertisement for, uh, that appeared for the Minneapolis Industrial Exposition of 1891, which is actually like in September. The pavilion has burned down at the beginning of June. But I, I don't know, they just figured we got, we got the uh, illustration, we're just gonna keep it in the, the book. And, uh, so even though it says the season of 1891, the concert season hadn't begun by the time the pavilion burned down. Where we know the name of the next concessionaire is because there's a fire, the pavilion burns down, and how much did he lose with the furniture and everything, and his name is H.M. Barnett. So if he already had all of his stock and furniture and everything else for the pavilion before the opening of the season in 1891, I think it's very likely that he was the concessionaire the previous season at least. He was remarkably young. Uh, Thomas Lowry hired him uh, to run his pavilion here. I mentioned James Beatty was about 85 years old back in the late 1870s when he was uh, running the boats for William King. Uh, so uh, Harry Barnett, when he starts here at Lake Harriet, is 16 years younger than Beatty. He's like 26 years old. Uh, and Lowry was looking for qualified people. He hired uh, a real estate man to uh, promote some of his property, including Lowry Hill, Edmund G. Wolf, who was very young. So I think it had to do with something that he saw in people. Uh, but of all of these concessionaires, Barnett is the one who stayed in the business of uh, various resorts, basically resorts of some way, restaurants uh, through his life into the 1920s. Um, so here, the year after the Lake Harry, New Lake Harry Pavilion is built, 
Thomas Lowry also owns the streetcar company up in Duluth. And this is thanks to uh, Aaron Isaac's book on the street railway system of Duluth. This is a photograph from that book. And there's an incline railroad to bump into Duluth. You know how there's a very steep hill. Uh, so along with this pavilion back in 1892, there's this incline railway built up the hill. And they have not just little gondolas or small cars. This is like you can fit 100 people. And this is like a moving barn up and down the hillside. And uh, he's already working with uh, H.M. Barnett, so he hires him to be the manager of Duluth, the Duluth Pavilion. And this, this kid, a kid is like 28 years old. <coughs> uh, so I was, and this is something else where when you go online and you start searching names, uh, the newspapers.com, more than just the Minneapolis and St. Paul newspapers. So it's the Duluth newspaper of 1892 that mentions Barnett's name. So randomly it shows up in the search. He's not involved with it very long, but I think that it's just an indication of uh, his abilities and the trust that Lowry was putting in. These are images from the, uh, the pavilion that's, I guess, most widely photographed and finally remembered. And uh, I refer to this as the Pagoda Pavilion because it is built to resemble a Chinese timber pagoda. It's on two levels. It's uh, designed by Harry Wild Jones the year after he has built the Minnetonka, Minnetonka Yacht Club. Lake Minnetonka, also wood shingle style. Uh, but uh, Jones could design in any number of traditional styles from throughout the world, whether it was uh, Byzantine revival, Lakewood Cemetery Chapel, or Chinese pagoda pavilion on the shores of Lake Harriet. Um, Gentleman mentioned they collect postcards, but actually, the time that we're talking about is sort of before most of the postcards were published. So this is a very early one in the lower right-hand corner, looking from where the streetcar station is now, the 42nd Queen corner, uh, down towards the lake shore. Similar view to where the Sunday school class is standing, having gotten off the streetcar and posing just along the edge of Queen um, with the tracks behind them. The lower left-hand corner is something that I have been aware of for years back when we were looking at newspapers through microfilms. And I came across this mention of a carousel down at uh, Lake Harriet in 1893. And I've, I've seen three photographs now, none of which are really, really detailed. Uh, but apparently there is there's a group for everything. There is like a national carousel uh, organization uh, based in DC. And they contacted Aaron Isaacs uh, because they knew that this carousel was connected to the streetcar. And uh, they had gotten uh, a photograph on some auction site that Wolof, W-A-L-L-O-F, local photographer who lived in Kenwood, uh, had taken. So we have three or four views of this. And what's, what's interesting, besides the fact that the organ that played with it was very, very loud, and the few people who lived in the neighborhood weren't too happy about that. And the musicians weren't too happy about it either, because they didn't shut down the carousel and the concerts were something wrong. Um, but uh, I, I had seen the carousel referred to as a Parisian carousel. And the, uh, the woman who uh, was researching this pointed out that it was clearly a German-built carousel. <laughs> so I thought, OK, why? <coughs> They're referring to it as a Parisian carousel. I guess that was just a popular term or concept. But I'm convinced that when you read carousel, it's sort of you can also take it as sort of like carousal. Yeah. And if you think per Parisian carousal, so then they gave it like a, a, a second name, which is the flying horses. So you'd be clear that this is actually a merry-go-round, uh, not, not something uh, as. Is that one of the dips on the Yes, platform? actually, thanks, Ruth. Uh, this is one of the views that we have, where if you zoom in on it, uh, we do have a very good photograph of this. You can see parts of the uh, women's toilet building that was built in 1892, the year before the, uh, the carousel went in. And this is just an example. Gilmore's was a well-regarded band that was contracted for so Barnett 
around the restaurant, which was on the upper level of the, of the pavilion. And he also was responsible for any other entertainment. The park board ran the boats, because that was, they knew that was going to make money. They knew how to do that. Um, but uh, Barnett brought in Shetland ponies and had a little pony ring, which you can't see clearly in these photographs. Uh, but that's where you have the, the photographs with the kids and the little carts that the little horses are pulling and everything. And uh, Barnett would do things uh, to promote involvement in the community and attracting families. So he was trying to be a good neighbor, uh, despite the loud carousel organ. I mentioned that sometimes we're just dealing with sort of randomly sourced information. So the Minnesota used to have a census every 10 years, offset five years from the national census. This is a page from the 1895 census. Who's down at Lake Harriet? At the Lake Harriet Pavilion, 25 people live there. Uh, if you look at, I have a map showing some of the outbuildings associated with the pavilion. This is privately owned land between the lake shore and the track, uh, which was White's property. And when, when the pavilion burned down, the new pavilion, the Pagoda Pavilion moved down to the lake shore, and uh, this, the uh, street art company at the time retained ownership of the private land. And there were all these miscellaneous structures, whether it was a photographer's studio or it's sort of like a midway, you know, carnival type atmosphere. Um, but there were dwelling places, 25 people living there. Oh, and by the way, same year, uh, we don't have a photograph of Barnett, and this is as close as I can come to an autograph because he wanted to do this aluminum token to promote his business. Uh, so there's H.M. Barnett, we see, of the Lake Harriet Park, uh, and it says a lemonade check, 10 cents for lemonade for the 1895 season. <coughs> Uh, so this is uh, zooming in a little bit, uh, and you start to see the individuals who are living there at the pavilion and, and the wide range of uh, their res responsibilities of uh, living there. Uh, and amazingly, to me anyway, several waiters are like 16 and 17 years old. Uh, and then you got the whole range of people who have more responsibility. But along uh, with H.M. Barnett uh, is his sister, Annie and her three ch young children. Uh, husband is apparently not around anymore. And so, H.M. Uh, Barnett's uh, sister, uh, Annie Anshevsky, and her three children are living uh, with him at the pavilion in the summer of 1895. Uh, every once in a while, you run across just a, a great article with information you never expected to find. I think this is a representative of that. Um, it's this idea that Barnett is so busy, he's really, he's 31 years old in 1895. Okay? Um, he's so busy that uh, he's running three venues for the street art company, Como Park, which has a pavilion, Lakeside Pavilion, built in 1893, and uh, Wildwood Amusement Park on Lake Bear, White Bear Lake. So how does he handle all that in the streetcar era? He has a custom streetcar fitted up to be living quarters, and he goes for a swim every night at the end of his working at Lake Harriet, and he runs over to the other resorts during the day and makes his way back to Lake Harriet by the next afternoon. In the meantime, uh, the car is going around the Twin Cities, um, advertising all the, the venues that the streetcar set up. Uh, so besides, I'm going to show you some images of these other resorts that he's running for the streetcar company at Cornwall Park and Wildwood, but besides those uh, were ones that there is a Jacob Barnett. I'm pretty much convinced that it's his younger brother, but I haven't established that directly. Um, but they're in overlapping businesses and occasionally in business together. And uh, Jacob is involved with a pavilion at Minnehaha Falls for several years, and also at Lake Phelan in St. Paul. Jacob lives on the shore of uh, Como Lake, and uh, 
stayed in the community in St. Paul for decades in some entertainment-related business. So these are photographs from uh, that the Barnett family donated to Minnesota Historical Society years ago. And wherever Jacob is, they've got a line drawn to him. His, he's called out by name. So we don't have a photograph, unless Harry's in this photograph. I don't know. Uh, but there's Jay Barnett uh, standing with a little kid inside the pavilion. And this was a uh, built by the streetcar company, operated on the same model as the Lake Harriet Pavilion. Uh, up to that point, people had come from St. Paul to go to Lake Harriet in 1893, 1894. Basically, the streetcar company said, oh, we're not doing anything at Lake Harriet this season. Why don't you go check out Como Park? And of course, why is it called the Como Harriet Streetcar Line? Because it runs through Como Park to get to downtown St. Paul. Uh, this is Wildwood, a little map in the middle, a little bit later. Uh, how do you get to Wildwood from the Twin Cities? The Wildwood Park is on the south shore of the lake. It's a little bit older amusement park. The streetcar company acquires it and goes through a number of buildings. After uh, Barnett is done at Lake Harriet, which has to do with the fire, you know, disasters. 1902 is the last season, 1903, he's ready to go, February, there's some work going on, the pavilion burns down. Uh, so that's the end of his career at Lake Harriet, uh, but he moves on to other venues, in particular Wildwood, where he lived, to manage uh, that for the streetcar system for several years. Okay, so here's the last of our major concessionaires, and the only one I've got a photograph of which I think you've probably seen this photograph before. So why are there ostriches at Lake Harriet? Well, if you're the concessionaire, you can pretty much call the shots. You've got a license to entertain, to attract people. He's got the ponies, don't worry. Uh, but he figures people will be really interested in seeing these ostriches, which are more commonly grown on large ostrich farms in California. Uh, and of course, women's fashion included very elaborate hats with ostrich feathers. Uh, this was a super big industry in uh, South Africa, but it had come over to this country as well. And so there he is standing with his ostriches, and the big eggs were on display. People could marvel at the big ostrich eggs. I don't know how many years the ostriches stayed at the area. Uh, maybe he gave them to Fish Jones, who ran the uh, a zoological uh, curiosity sort of business, first downtown Minneapolis, then moved it out uh, across from uh, the track down in Minneapolis Falls. But here they are anyways in 1904, 1905, and that's the original band shell, the, the bandstand that's up on the roof. Now I know we've got some fans of Harry Well Jones, the architect here tonight, and what I've mentioned in articles is he was not infallible. This is a Banshell, which is based on a Greek, a Greek temple, which was acoustically terrible. And so the band would get up there and the sound would go everywhere but the audience. It was lovely, and it was moved to the east shore of Lake Harriet up on the parkway at 46th Street or Kings Highway, where it uh, stood until 1914 or so. Uh, but it looked great. It looked great. Um, so Eshman was another individual who was connected with Linden Hills. He actually had lived in the neighborhood going back to about 1899 and would continue living in the neighborhood until he passed away in the early 1930s. And he had a background in business, this newfangled telephone invention and things, and he got involved with music. He was very interested in, in music, so he sort of gravitated towards entertainment. And when the park board built this Pavilion in 19, opened in 1904. Uh, Eshman made a proposal to be the concessionaire. The park board was handling music and boat rental. But there was a restaurant uh, to the right, the south wing of the pavilion. And um, obviously, anything you could do out in the concourse here with ostriches or ponies. Uh, so Eshman was the concessionaire, it appears, at least through 1908. But um, Here's a few views of what's going on at the pavilion a few years later. This is the new 1905 band shell at the top, which doesn't look like much, but acoustically performs very well. And then uh, there was this fad of canoeing on Lake Harriet, 
This is the Harriet Coon Club. They had massive parades and festivals of uh, canoes back then. Um, so this is this new superintendent is hired by the Board of Park Commissioners. His name is Theodore Worth. Comes from Hartford, Connecticut. He really knows everything, and he's very good. From design to um, to management, Parker builds him a house, which is over at forty, probably forty second Lindale. Fortieth and Bryant. Oh, thank you, Tom. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think there are tours, although maybe not uh, currently. But there have been tours. I think the superintendent is living uh, there again. Um, but that was built as contract condition for Theodore Worth to move to Minneapolis to take on this job. Uh, Worth immediately knew that the park board should be running their own concessions. This is a revenue source. You want to serve the public. You want to have high standards. And he didn't like a lot of what he saw down at Lake Harriet, the way there was that massive concourse for parking carriages and automobiles between the streetcar tracks and the pavilion. Uh, so right away, among the other 100 pages of proposals that he had, were radical changes at Lake Harriet, none of which they could afford. So it took several years of uh, promoting the idea of managing their own concessions before the park board finally took over. John Eshman was the last private concessionaire, in this case under contract, to the park board to run the public uh, building. Uh, before he left, though, he, he uh, applied to the park board to print and distribute this postcard which I think is one of the loveliest postcards. I mean, I got a lot more than I want to admit in my collection, mm -hmm. um, but there are some that stand out. And I think that whoever produced this postcard, a multi-view is not unusual of that era in about 1905. Um, but this is very beautifully done, and it includes both that common view from the front back in 1904, facing the Concord side, the, ba the band up there at the base of the original band shell, there was a swimming area out on the lakeside that didn't last very long because kids are noisy and you got a concert going on you know, 20 feet away. You got the cafe with beautiful china place settings um, and then the, uh, the piazza along the outside. So um, really, I, I, I would love to have visited this building. I don't think that we're going to see something like this again, but. Uh, I think this, this really captures it. And then, of course, if you go through enough postcards, every once in a while you turn one over, and you find out that uh, this postcard on the right, on the lower left, that's the back side of the postcard, and it is sent by John Ashman um, in 1908. So, so if some of you have seen this. I've back in 1986, I was Tom and I were on the band shell committee. Uh, Milo was designing the band shell. And um, for the dedication, I put together a little history of the pavilions, including this map, sort of explaining. So, how did all these buildings actually fit together? But it's I'm I'm always struck by the fact that there's been this continuity of activity at this one place um, all these years, and so this sort of is the key plan to show how they overlap. Oh, so I got an epilogue because I was thinking, okay, now remember, Theodore Worth was really devoted to this idea of quality public service um, in so many different ways, developing a park system. And uh, I mean, I love ice cream. I love the park board's ice cream, popcorn, grew up with it. Right? Some of you did, you know. Um, there was also a, ta a taffy. Like yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, which was um, Barnett's recipe. And he took that recipe, and whenever he moved like, to other recreational places in Iowa or back to Philadelphia, he had his taffy recipe and, and the popcorn that he developed at Lake Harry with, mm -hmm. with him. Um, but and so we're, Tom and I are on this committee, and there's going to be a new band shell finally. And of course, there's going to have to be a new refectory building also. <laughs> you start finding out that the park board is losing money selling popcorn and ice cream 
at Lake Harriet. <laughs> How can that be? <laughs> well, you know, if, if your theater were the 1910, or the park board, this vibrant, growing, well-managed park system for decades, and you're devoted to that, and you've got this management system, there's a good chance you're going to do it well, and it's going to be a revenue source. By the time you get to the 1980s, the park board has a lot of other priorities. Uh, they're not, so they're, they're, the public is expecting food down the lakes in the hot falls, but I got to um, meet Don Sigelkow when there was a community advisory committee for um, turning the refectory at Lake Harriet over to a private vendor. And I found you know, great online, I realize you can't find everything online that exists, but you got quotes like this, um, and I can just see Don admitting this to the reporter, not thinking it's going to end up in the newspaper. Um, but, you know, we started outsourcing food concessions in 2001 when I decided we just weren't that good at food service and never would be. Uh, so Tim Fish is taking over concessions at Lake Ahuna in 2004. Cecil moved in at Mihal a year later. And I don't think any of us in our wildest dreams thought they would be as successful as they are, and now we want to circle back to Lake Harry and find a vendor that meets the needs of that area. And all that they knew is there was a bias that it should not be another fried fish restaurant. Because we already had Tim Fish doing a very good job of where they come from. It should be something else. And I was off the committee by the time the vendors came in. I think there were 15 or so proposals, and they chose Kim Bartman, who had developed a whole range of businesses in uh, Minneapolis and has been managing uh, Ben Pickle since 2011. So we're back to an era of concessionaires, I guess. That wasn't my main thought for the talk, and I never imagined that we'd be here this evening in person and you wouldn't have any refreshments. <laughs> but that's, that's how it's is that ice summer. cream and uh, Ice cream and taffy? Yeah. 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 And they have uh, truffle popcorn, which I can have down there, which is pretty good too. Yeah. Peter, um, this is like a Charles McCormick used to have a vote in second. Like, uh, uh, didn't Charles McCormick release Yes. Yeah. So I sort of skimmed over um, a few years between the time that Palmer definitely left uh, following the park board coming in in 1885 and the pavilion opening in 1888. The park board takes control of the lake shore. They've figured out that you can make money renting boats at, at uh, Lake Harriet. The food service wasn't so much the focus, but uh, that was um, very desirable to rent boats at Lake Harry. So when Colonel Charles McCormick Reed, who has this beautiful home and farm in the southwest shore of Lake Harriet, um, is selected to run the boats, he's also um, I did find a reference to the fact that, you know, so he's got a dairy farm, basically, so uh, he's supplying milk that's used at the pavilion, the 1888 pavilion. There is a uh, funny, I think, amusing letter uh, he writes from Cairo. He's on a worldwide trip because he's a wealthy guy. Uh, and he's pleading with the park board. He's like, I forgot to apply by the date you had to continue my contract to rent the boats, but you know, you'd really need to hire me because I'm the guy who's providing the standard services that the community wants. He didn't convince them. Um, the, the person who Jonathan Palmer got into a fight with was also a resident right along the shore at Lake Harriet. His name was Austin Hammond. And uh, Austin and his wife, Jesse, had bought Lakeshore lots from Henry Beard in those early years where actually if you bought the Lakeshore lot, you owned down to the Lakeshore and the rights to that Lakeshore because there was no public, there was a sort of public 
drive you could from part of the lake, a little carriage drive, but the ownership went to the lake shore, what they call riparian rights. And so uh, Hammond had this property, and the park board hired him to run boats for a year or so. And you got Palmer and Hammond suing each other in court and fighting over who had the rights to put a dock in and rent boats. And I think uh, Palmer just threw up his hands and said, I got other things to do. Uh, so those are the other names, Hammond. Um, and I, I don't know if there was anybody else besides Reeve. But I was focused more on people who were running you know, the major operation, whether, especially once it was a pavilion or in the case of Palmer, where the, the ownership and the, the people who were motivated to attract riders, you know, down to, big crowds down to Lake Harriet were working under contract. So I'm, I'm calling them concessionaires. Uh, there, I think Reeve at one time was also saying, if you give me back my contract, I'm gonna build a building that's gonna be used to sell refreshments and you're really gonna you know, appreciate it. Uh, but even somebody who's wealthy has to follow the rules sometimes. So, okay. Any other questions? I see an arm back here. Peter, the, uh, yeah, wait. <laughs> I recall, uh, the photo in uh, Linda Mills Dentistry of uh, high divers off of the top of the pavilion. Yeah. When was that? Was that part of the swimming or was that the, the attraction? Uh, I think it was about 1914 and it was, I, I couldn't, I'm, I'm aware that what was that swimming pool in back on the lake side of the pavilion wasn't very deep. <laughs> so I didn't understand the idea of building what I think were temporary diving platforms to, because yep. you're already probably about 12, 14 feet above the water up on that, the garden terrace that we've been listening to the concerts from, and then building up from that. Um, you can approach the history of the lake and the entertainment and the pavilions in particular from a number of di different directions. This is sort of a different approach, but usually people think of it in terms of what was the entertainment in terms of music and who was offering that, what was the quality, frequency, cost, was it free, did you have to pay? Uh, so that's, that's much more well known or covered. Uh, but there, were, there was this time during another of the national recessions in the 1890s about the time that um, Barnett had 25 people living down there at the pavilion and with the octagonal aluminum token. Um, and they went from high class, nationally known bands to um, vaudeville and any kind of attraction. You know, they would have just spectacles, basically. Curiosities, not exactly like the freak show at the midway, but um, any, anything went, and that's when it became very controversial because the park board uh, didn't really want that going on. Um, but they didn't, it was a private pavilion and they didn't have full control over it. So there's, there's a wide range of accessory activities, including in 1898, I think, during the Spanish-American War, they were recreating naval battles, and they would publish noise notices to the residents of the neighborhood saying, tomorrow night at 8 o'clock, there's going to be this massive bombardment. Uh, you know, tie up your horse. Uh, so uh, it, was, it was sort of an amusement park in a lot of ways over a period of time. And there was tension between the neighborhood and the operators of the entertainment at the lake on off. That's why it took until 1904 before the neighborhood finally agreed to do something that looked a lot more civilized, publicly owned and managed uh, pavilion, beautiful classical design pavilion, not the honky tonk. Clara Walden. Yeah. Other questions? Um, have you been following um the development of uh, the new pavilion over by Pedema Casca 
Do you want to replace the one that replace the one that burned down? Yeah, I ended up on um, several of the park board's email lists, so I get all sorts of updates, including the project specific one that you're mentioning. And having served on um, the committee that was working with the commemoration of the Dakota at Bidet Makaska, um, I, was, I was familiar with the Dakota representatives who are interested in expanding upon that recognition around the lake. So it's sort of like a following on on something I was involved with for years, but I saw two schemes that were considered initially, both of which looked attractive to me. And I'm not sure where they're going to get the money to build those or what the status is, but I think that the board, after some hesitation, did agree to go ahead with one of them. Um, I don't know what the status is as far as is there a specific construction schedule. I, I'm pretty sure that it was aspirational as far as assuming that they'd get enough money to build it. But, uh, that, there was, I'm not going to go back to the image, but. Uh, there was a private boat club on that site in 1900 called the Lurland Club. What was there up to 1900 uh, from the late 1870s? Um, and I, I was hoping that they would at least acknowledge that, if not in the name of the pavilion, at least in some kind of display, because uh, that is a tangible part of the history of that site going back, going back years. Peter, is there any documentation between um, the uh, Theodore Worth and the Lowry family, either Thomas Lowry or Goodrich Lowry, in terms of these kinds of, um, of deals or these kinds of um, arrangements that they had about the lakes? Well, there's quite a, I mean, the, the expert is the other David Smith. Like R. David Smith is an expert, but the, the, the author of the uh, park history and the blog dealing with all things park related. Um, but I've read enough of the histories to have a general answer to that question, which is Thomas Lowry was a very big supporter of the public park system, and it predated Worth's arrival, but it also extended. Lowry passed away in 1909, and was in, in health for the last year or so, but. There was a few year overlap uh, when he was still involved and the whole parade stadium or the parade park, which is now Minneapolis Sculpture Garden, was donated uh, and improved at that point. Those arrangements were made. Um, you know, the whole Columbia Park uh, up in Northeast Minneapolis was something that Lowry granted as a gift uh, early on. In the 1890s, and Lowry did have extensive dealings with the park board because of the sort of difference of interest in managing entertainment at Lake Harriet, but that was before Theodore Worth came in. Yes. Any other questions? No,